All right. Welcome, everybody. We are live here on another Sandler webinar. This is Break the Rules, Close More Sales, New Paradigms for Peak Performance in Your Sales Team. I'm your host, Mike Montague, and I am Head of Franchise Strategy at Sandler and my guest this month. Uh, she's making a comeback, Lisa Ellis, Head of Product. She joined us uh, in December to talk about how you can close the, the year strong. Right now, she's going to tell us about a lot of the cool work she's been doing behind the scenes to develop our kind of cutting edge, latest modernized version of our sales training program and how we're breaking the rules on what you might think is stereotypical sales training in order to get better results. And we got a lot of stuff to dive into today. But first, if you're not familiar with Sandler, we are the world's largest sales training organization with over 200 locations, the market leader in tech-enabled data-driven sales training and management. So um, we have over 400 trainers around the world collecting best practices and testing this stuff every day with tens of thousands of salespeople. It's over 500,000 hours of training annually uh, that we do. We're collecting all this best practice and we're learning so that we can help you get to results faster, sell more, sell more easily, and uh, just get to the to the next level. So Lisa, I want to bring you in and start talking here about the hidden flaws of, of sales training and some of the common misconceptions that we hear in this that are holding people back. Some of the stuff that we think we should be doing. And I think if we relate it to uh, our real world, right? You always see people that think maybe that um, they're trying to do something healthy, but they're actually eating like, uh, they're trying to eat vegetarian, but they're eating that vegetarian junk food where they add like all kinds of, they didn't put meat in there, but they added every other chemical known to man into this fake burger. And that's not actually healthier than maybe even just eating a hamburger. I don't want to get political right off the bat, but counterintuitive things that when we are, we're trying to do the best for our sales team, but it doesn't really work sometimes. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. And I think that's something that we've all got to, to keep in mind. And so, you know, I'm going to bring up something that's made the rounds and um, really kind of sets the conversation, right? Selling is always um, kind of on this journey of becoming more complex and more challenging, right? Uh, and so this graphic over here, this is from Gartner. Um, we kind of call this the, the spaghetti on the slide in terms of where does this journey start? When does the seller get brought in? Uh, and how do you negotiate this all the way through the close? And what's been really interesting is for years that, you know, we've been trying to train our way out of this problem um, where we train the sellers. Here are all the potential ways that this can, you know, uh, pivot directions. You might go back a step, forward a step. Um, but the buying process really isn't linear. And we've been asking salespeople to make up for that buyer dysfunction by getting smarter, by going through more training. Um, and it's really led to a really interesting conundrum where we're asking salespeople to just learn one more thing. They've got to be experts in everything from prospecting to post-sale support. And that's a lot. So we're just adding more and more to these sellers who are buried in this ever-growing role. Um, and it's, it's been an unintentional and kind of a slow creep up. As buying has gotten more complex, sell, selling has gotten more complex. These two things have been chasing each other. Um, and we've been trying to train our way out of the problem. Uh, and and what's, you know, what's interesting about this is we lead to some of the typical traps we run into with sales training um, and, you know, what sales training can do, right? So I've got a couple of the, the old rules. Now I want people to chime into the chat here too, Lisa, not yeah. to cut you off, but type in the chat. What do you think, what are some common mistakes that you see people make in sales training? And we can go ahead and put up our, our six that we think are the, are the six yeah. biggest traps, the kind of unwritten rules of old traditional sales training that maybe don't apply anymore. Um, there's some interesting ones that didn't make our, our cut, but I, I would love to hear from you in the comments. If you have one, shout it out and then we'll put you up there. But um, things like we have to get everybody together, right? It used to be the old sales uh, kickoff. We got to bring everybody together for two days or when we hire a new salesperson, they got to come to home office and they have to uh, do this onboarding two weeks and then they're fixed and they're ready to go sell. Or uh, we see it a lot. We're going to talk about it a, a little bit later is, like that inspiring speech. We want somebody to get the old, like, this is a football motivational halftime talk to get our sales team to go run through walls. And we're going to go do the old kind of Wolf of Wall Street boiler room 
like uh, make the dials, never take no for an answer, always be closing. Uh, there you go, Dan, Don. Yeah. Do it there. Um, all of those kind of things that we see in traditional training, and, and tell us about some of these other six. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, the best way to improve performance is by training those frontline sellers, right? They're the ones out there making the calls. They're dialing for dollars. They're the ones that are in front of customers every time. So that's where all of your training efforts should be focused. Um, not paying attention to that selling is, you know, kind of uh, a team sport these days. One of the other things that we see is that, you know, you got to focus on tactical scripts, the techniques, the tools. What are our best performers doing? How do we get the, the middle and low performers like copying like automatons what those high performers are doing, right? Um, and that's always been the talk track is how do we get those middle people up performing more like those high performers? Some of the other things might be to streamline. A lot of us have very constrained budgets and we've got to train lots and lots of people. So if we create a standard training program for one size fits all for everybody, that's how we're going to maximize our budget. Um, and, you know, one of the other things is there's a single best way to you know deliver training and onboarding informa information. This is one of my favorites. Um, just because there's always that next silver bullet of, oh man, this technology is going to really revolutionize how we're going to deliver training and it's going to really change or virtual is the best. No, in person is the best. And, you know, you see all these different schools of thought. The that's a huge one. one. I, I was just going to jump in there for a second is that's the next thing, right? Oh, virtual is the thing or um, whatever this tool micro is, learning. this next app. Like yes. what we got to do is, yeah, put the micro learning in the CRM and then everybody will be fixed. It'll be free and cheap and easy and everybody will magically sell more. But Nick, you know, kind of shared in the comment, uh, usually there's some sort of lack of clarity or actionable follow-up. Like it doesn't actually change and enable salespeople to sell better. It just makes us feel better that we marketed the idea of what our sales messaging should be. Right. We didn't actually get any buy-in or understanding. Exactly. And the, you know, the last one here is that it's too expensive and difficult to keep up with the pace of change with technology and all of the stuff that's going on in the selling environment. I mean, the last year has just been this meteoric rise of generative AI and how that's going to impact everything. And, oh, we've got to learn something else. Um, and it's, it's definitely a challenge to incorporate into the, your training, but there's definitely, um, I think, uh, uh, reasons to break this rule, right? Um, so are you ready to get into it? You ready to break some? Yeah, let's jump into it. We're talking about counterintuitive strategies then to break the performance. So just for the record, you know, if you're taking screenshots, we had somebody ask about the presentation. We don't share the slides, but you, this recording will be available instantly at, on here on YouTube. So you can go back, you can take any screenshots you want, but we won't actually share a PowerPoint file. Uh, <laughs> but this recording is up and, and available in public anytime you need it. But that was the don't do slide. Those yeah. were the myths. So don't do that. We'll put another slide up at the end when we rewrite these six rules. But let's talk about some of these other strategies. Lisa. So, so my first one that I wanted to talk about is that training has to be that super high motivation kickoff, um, the short-term pushes of, of change, event-based training. Um, and that's a, I, I, you know, I'll acknowledge that's a cool way to get started. Um, one of the questions I've got for folks on the chat is, you know, thinking about all of the lectures or speakers you've seen, who was the most motivating speaker uh, that's really thought like that, that you thought had a big impact? So anything from a TED talk or podcast you're listening to um, would love to hear, you know, in the chat, what's something that really inspired you? Um, oh, yeah. Put it in the comments right now. Your favorite TED talk of all time or favorite motivational video. I think some of mine were actually the promotional videos. Did you ever see the Diamond Dallas Page uh, I forget the guy's name now, but he had an incredible weight loss journey. And he went from like not being able to walk in a wheelchair wow. to like sprinting down the road through yoga. And the whole, it makes me cry every time. I'm going to get oh. choked up just talking about it. Of course, we got the classics like Zig Ziglar and, and other people coming in here. Do you have one that, that jumps off to you that really got you like in the feels or really got you motivated? Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I think one of the big ones for me was Adam Grant. He's got this, uh, the book Think Again, and hearing mm -hmm. his TED Talk on how we can relearn stuff really, um, really resonated with me and just kind of my approach. So that one really motivated me. Um, but what was interesting is it didn't actually change anything that I was doing. I felt inspired. I felt lit up. I felt um, excited. But I, di I didn't actually know how to translate that inspiration 
into a practical way to change. Um, and so that's the challenge that we have with a lot of these, right? Um, where it's great, you feel inspired. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Now be on your merry way. Um, and so one of the things that we really wanna think about and, and kind of turn this paradigm on our head is that inspiration, that motivation with a training event, highly valuable. That emotional resonance is really powerful, but what really actually changes behavior is a continuous learning model so that it doesn't just stop. And, you know, this is a, um, a, a common framework you see put out by some really, really great thought leaders in this space. Um, but this is the idea of you're not just going to hit it once. You're not just going to go to that training event because then somebody might be, you know, becoming a little bit more of a specialist, but then we get to that forgetting curve and everything drops off. Um, and you, you stop seeing um, that, um, that excellence in performance. Uh, and then, um, so really continuous learning is key. And one of the more interesting things that I stumbled across recently was we're working with some of the best um, assessment provider providers in our space to predict what are the traits and competencies that people have innately within them that make them great at selling. And if you had looked at this about you know five or six years ago, even um, longer than that, competitiveness was a trait that was constantly on the top of predicting success in sales. That has shifted. Now it's learning agility. If you are good at learning and being agile with it and following this continual learning model, that's going to be a better predictor of your success in a complex sales role um, uh, than, than that competitiveness, which is really interesting. Uh, I think that's huge. And I want to highlight that here for everybody as we're thinking about how to change your sales in this year and make a, a measurable impact. It's not just about being inspired in the short term. It's about developing the ability to learn because we're in this new environment. And that's what I think those traditional models miss is that if it was stable for 50 years, we could probably teach some techniques, say, go do that and get work on inspiration because really what we're trying to do is continually get you to do those things. And, and it kind of reminds me of like the factory model, right? That a hundred years ago, we need humans to be in a factory and do this repetitive job. We need salespeople to make the same cold call over and over again. But in today's world of disruption and change and uncertainty, we really need to be better at learning and better at adapting and listening to our prospects than we do memorizing the scripts. We don't need to memorize and deliver a script because the next person is going to be completely different than the one we just talked to. Yeah. Well, and I, I can tell you, we've seen these comments come in. We've got a lot of yoga fans here. Yoga has been transformative for a bunch of our viewers today, which I, I very much support. So I think that's that's great. Yeah, I shouted out that Diamond Dallas Page yoga video. Yeah. And it's incredible. I, I'll, I'll we'll have to post it in the comments or something. Uh, you can go check that out on YouTube after we're done. Uh, but that's a good rule because it brings us to our next one. That yep. technology distracts. If you're on YouTube right now and you get distracted uh, looking up the Diamond Dallas Page video, you're not learning your, your sales training. And I think way too many people get afraid of technology, right? And then they get hands off. So tell us about this one, Lisa, and how we can break this rule. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of different, you know, training rules we're breaking with this. It used to be that, you know, you'd show up to your instructor-led person or uh, training devices away, put like, put your phones on silent, turn off your notifications. This is, we're here to learn. We're not here to get distracted by work. Um, and I think that that paradigm in particular has really shifted with virtual because you're on your device. You're still getting your, your Slack or your team's notifications while you're in your training. It is still important to pay attention, but we have to know that realistically, this technology is going to be everywhere. So the idea of a technology free zone or it's going to distract you from training. One, as trainers and, and facilitators, we have to know that that distraction is there. We have to be more compelling. So that's where that inspiring piece is still a little true, true, but we also need to know that how people actually bring these skills to life is through technology, right? We're all engaging in a virtual or techno uh, technological sale. There's more documentation we need to do. So uh, this is the Sandler success triangle. If you're not familiar with Sandler, Sandler, this is one of the main reasons why I love working with this organization because we really believe in this and that all of our content is, is kind of built and we think about it through this lens of what are the behaviors, what are the attitudes, what are the techniques that are going to lead you to be successful? Because if you don't have one side of this triangle, so if you're training the attitudes, you're training techniques, but you're not 
talking about the behaviors and the behaviors that happen in the technology, um, you're going to run into challenge. So that's why I invite you to bring technology in as a teammate to your sales team, because that is really critical. I think the example here for me was in colleges and, and high schools, they were using the essay as a form of testing until last year when AI and ChatGPT came out. And then they instantly had to say, you know what, hands up, the essay as a homework, especially for online courses, is gone. Mm -hmm. uh, we can no longer test writing skills by having them type up an essay over three or four weeks and, and submit it because that world is gone. But in sales today or in our sales training, how many of us have had to adapt to that, right? Yeah. We weren't necessarily forced to. So we're still saying like, type up your script or read the script or do something old and we haven't leveraged. Well, maybe we need to teach screen sharing. Maybe we need to teach technology and, and using the CRM in the training itself, or maybe we need to be able to take notes and have engagement and other things that are more modern ways of learning and interacting or being in the flow of work rather than trying to hide and say, no, you have to get out of the flow, come over here and do your learning and then go back, yeah, right? Exactly. And so that learning out of context of your work is really the, the big challenge. And I absolutely love uh, the Sandler rule. And this came out with our How to Sell to the Modern Buyer book. This was our one of our newer rules, which is use technology to engage, not to hide. Um, and this has so many applications from how you sell to how you train, right? So how do you use technology to engage your learners? Um, uh, and how do you use technology to get them, get them sticky with applying these new behaviors and techniques and attitudes? Um, and Ultimately, though, what I, I really think is, is critical about the training is we can still focus on the seller. We don't need to focus on the technology itself. It's there. It's right along. Um, but what we should really be doing is focusing on the seller and what they can actually control. Because if we think about the sales process and what salespeople can actually control, how they can make an impact, they can address the emotional component of purchase decisions better than any technology. How many of you have been trying to make a purchase? You get this chat bot in front of you and mm -hmm. you're like, cool, awesome. I don't have to talk to a human. This feels comfortable because I'm good with text. Um, for those of you in the millennial generation, that might be your comfort zone. Talking to a human can be a little scary sometimes. But then you're not sure if you're making the right decision. You spin on it. You're not sure if you're ready to go. And that's where talking to a real person can help. So that's a more of a consumer example. But in business to business, this is really critical because ultimately that decision to spend money, to make a purchase, to make a change, that is an emotionally connected decision. Um, and I think that's where we can train salespeople to be great. You know, we can use technology to collaborate, to help us generate those leads. But when it's time to pick up the phone or get on a Zoom call or knock on a door and talk to a real person, that's where we can really um, see some some great uh, um, great change happen for salespeople. Yeah, and I want to get a little bit uh, more comments in the uh, the chat here on this, so you can join the the com conversation here by commenting on YouTube about this rule because I think we're starting to do something very meta. And every time we do this, it's weird. We we're doing training about sales training about salespeople who kind of have to educate their customers and engage their customers as well. And it starts becoming like three or four layered. But I, I'm thinking the people that joined this webinar today, they're thinking like, I want to break the rules and close more sales. You could also see this slide as focus on the customer. Yes. Don't use a technology gadget just because you think it's a cool gadget. Or sometimes it's the way you use the technology. So for example, the Calendly scheduling link. For me, it's been a lifesaver in scheduling all the Sandler podcasts and all the guests and stuff. It saves me hours and hours every single week of setting appointments with people. But if you're with a prospect and you say, oh, I'm very busy, you know, here, use my link. Like, I don't have time to call you. Uh, pick a link on my calendar because I'm more important than you are. You're sending the wrong message, right? You want to be using these technologies because it saves your buyer time or your trainees time or your salesperson's time if you're the manager. And even if you're the owner or leader of the organization, you need to think which technologies are going to add value to our clients, to our sellers, and are going to engage better, not allow us to automate, save money, you know, make the conversation and the um, experience worse, right? We've all seen that. And I think it happened in the 
pandemic too, where it's like everything got just a little bit worse. The customer service got a little bit worse. Um, everything, you know, gets a little bit lower quality rather than how can we leverage technology to increase high definition, you know, high levels uh, of engagement. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Mike. And one of the other interesting um, to, to uh, interesting stats that I read around this is that with all the generative AI stuff coming out, you know, there's a lot of like concern that, oh, it's going to take the sales job. So prospecting, cold calling, that's not going to need to be a skill anymore. They're going to have auto dialers and generative AI for all of that. Um, but when a bunch of sales leaders were actually surveyed about this late last year, about 80% of them said that they would actually need to hire more people to respond to the generative AI wave than reducing or cutting staff. So, and that was specifically for sales leaders. So I found that really interesting. I'm going to bring up my other stat before we move along and we'll get to the next one. But um, we've shared the stat a bunch, uh, even at last year's summit and things that um, like 97% of the way through the sale before somebody wants to talk to a salesperson now, or 76% of people would prefer a rep free experience. And I always say yes, but 97% of a sale is zero revenue for the company. We need 100% of the sale, right? And 76% of people don't want to talk to a salesperson until they do, until they have that emotional component and they go, oh my gosh, I'm scared. I'm going to make the wrong decision. I don't know if there's a warranty. I'm going to ride the wrong thing. This is complicated. I need a consultant. And then they really, really want that human connection and that human assurance and trust that yeah. they just can't get. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so the next rule that we're going to break, um, this is one of my favorites. The best you can help hope for is a bell curtain, right? Um, best way to improve sales performance is to focus on those really tactical items that are going to move that low and middle or like get you up to that comfortable middle. You're always going to have your high performers, your lone wolves, your outliers um, who are knocking it out of the park, crushing their quotas. Um, and then maybe we can get most of the people into the middle. And anybody you can't get up that curve, you coach them out, right? Um, that's kind of the the old old training rule or old sales performance rule. And, you know, I, I'm curious um, how many of, of the folks joining us today, now chime in in the comments, have you ever had a cold call script that you had to follow? That was one of my first jobs was uh, I was hooked up to an auto dialer. We were calling. Um, I had a script I had to follow. I had my branching scenario if they said no or uh, why are you calling me? Um, and so it was uh, it was a little wild. Um, uh, and that was, uh, that was, that was, uh, you know, a while ago, but that's what they were trying to do was get me up to that comfortable middle. Right. Yeah. And I think for me, this was a, a game changer too. Uh, I kind of mentioned already that I grew up in entertainment and performance mm -hmm. and there's this weird thing where if you're up in front of a large audience, you kind of expect a bell curve. There are going to be some people that love what you do. There's some people that hate what you do. And most of the people are going to be, you know, kind of on your side, kind of positive, happy, and that that's the, the best you can do. But what we found really is the opposite is true. We can move this middle that, that the effective people are not settling for that, or they move this curve up and squish it so that they're getting a lot more people at the top performance. And that's what we really want is not people that are robots that are average. So here's another great one using chat GPT is if you ask chat GPT to write a 30 second commercial or cold call script for you, it will do it. But what it's reading is everything on the internet and giving you the average 30 second commercial of all of the sellers. Well, surprise, 53% of sellers miss quota, which means if you take the average 30 second commercial, it's going to be a bad one that derived from reps that miss quota. Yes. So what you really want is the top performers of who you want to model and, and pull after. Absolutely. And this is where I think that technology as a teammate and a lot of the other things that are happening can help us break this rule. And when we rethink how we can improve performance. So the first thing that I want to talk about in terms of shifting this paradigm is nudge theory. Um, and so I don't know if, uh, if people are familiar with this, but the idea here is that behavioral nudges are any inter intervention um, that alters a behavior in its predictable way without forbidding options um, uh, or significantly changing economic incentives. Nudges are not mandates. Um, and so this is one of the things that, you know, when we think about how we embed 
new skills, behaviors, um, process uh, in, uh, in, in training um, and that continuous learning model, we want to think about ways to nudge people to it. Um, and so a process initiated nudge would be something like an alert as you're going through your CRM and going from a, you know, one sales stage to another um, reminder to, to go do something. Information presentation nudge uh, might be something similar where you're getting insights about a buyer and, hey, they're, um, they're, they are searching for these keywords. Here's some information about our product that addresses those concerns for keywords, right? So that's an information presentation nudge. Then there's the social comparison nudge, which is so powerful and so valuable and can have nothing to do with technology. Now, a lot of us encounter this in social media. That's the like button. Um, we are all very programmed to respond to that social comparison nudge. But in a professional environment, there are lots of ways to hit that. And one of the biggest ways for that social comparison nudge is for sales leaders. Mike, would you, would you talk about this Sandler rule? I think this has been a, a really powerful one. Yeah, this is one of our management rules. So Sandler rules for sales leaders. You can find the whole list of these rules on our YouTube channel as well, or get the book uh, available anywhere you buy books. Uh, but this rule is don't let the salespeople leave the training in the classroom. And I think kind of three things come to mind for me. Number one is just the fear of missing out. When you show them that somebody else is making sales in this, they get that social comparison and they're like, oh, the top people in our company, the people closing the biggest deals, getting the biggest commission checks are doing it this way or saying it this way. People go, oh, I want to be the, that person. I want to get those checks, right? And they start doing it. And also we can start sort of... Um, developing this uh, sort of accountability cross between people that it's not just um, who knows it and who can pass the test. I think that's the old way of thinking is that we used to measure training by saying who, um, who can pass the final exam, right? Whoever gets certification gets 80%. But in today's world, that social comparison can be up in front of the classroom. Who can stand up and deliver a 30 second commercial? Or who can show me on their recordings or in their gong calls that they delivered an up Sandler upfront contract, or they asked this question that we practiced. And I think of, uh, back to my days as an athlete and, and stuff, I didn't ever get very high up there, but I was on a good soccer team and we would practice this move, you know, like a, a spin move on the field. And it's great if you can practice it all day long, but the ones who can do it in a game against a live defender that doesn't know you're going to do that, those are the people that find success. And so I think we can start sharing success stories. We can start building accountability and we can highlight the people that are doing it well to create the social comparison. Nudge. Yeah, I can, uh, I can give you a, a, a real world example. We were just, um, uh, I, I've sat in on lots of organizations, win rooms, uh, and uh, was, was there the other week. And we were going around and hearing about what the clear future commitment was that everybody had garnered, right? So that's one of the things that we're talking about is you wrap up a call, it's kind of the upfront contract sandwich um, uh, and you get that clear future commitment at the end of the call so that you know what the next steps are, the client knows what um, the next steps are uh, and really going around the room and showing that. And the, the manager was giving coaching and this is a good one. This seems like they're just moving stuff forward and having that leader really invested in, in those behaviors um, was really critical. And you could see it, you could feel the energy around changing the behaviors um, on that call. So that was that was a good one. Um, and then uh, this one is, is really interesting. So this is also tied back to like, how do we break out of the paradigm of the bell curve and really think about using technology as a teammate to increase performance? Um, and so this is a really interesting uh, uh, study. Mike, we can probably link to this uh, research paper uh, in the chat as well. Um, but the chart that you're seeing is one of the first working papers out of Harvard Business School talking about using generative AI to improve quality of work product. And these were for consultants at Boston Consulting Group. Um, and so those that didn't use AI, there was their quality. Those that used AI were in green, and those that used AI with a little bit of training on generative AI were in the red. And so you're seeing that performance move quite significantly, even without training, just adding that technology as a teammate in there. Um, and it, it's really interesting seeing how this works. 
So give them that, that nudge using technology. And again, this is where we can use it to engage, not to hide. Maybe they're getting to that quality work product a bit faster. We're meeting deadlines. We're more precise with it, right? Yeah, for me, this is about design solutions. Again, I think of another fun viral video where people were taking the stairs in the, the subway. Mm-hmm. and or there, Sorry, nobody was taking the stairs. They were all taking the escalator on the sides. And then these uh, engineers came up and they turned the stairs going up to the subway into a piano. Yes. And when you stepped on each stair, they lit up and they played a sound. And all of a sudden, then everybody started taking the stairs. So they were getting people more fit, exercising, eliminating bottlenecks and and lines at the escalator and having all kinds of good results because of a design solution. And it's something that people wanted. And so when we think about our training with our clients or with our our salespeople, how can we design training that people actually want to attend? How can we set up these tools that make their job easier, that make it more intuitive to actually have the conversation? I think... We've all seen that with different apps or things that we've tried. And sometimes you're like, oh, this software sounds like a, a great deal. And then you buy it and you're like, I'm never using it. It's out of the flow of work. It doesn't help me. It, it's actually creating more work than if I had just done it manually. And then there's other times where you just, this is the best thing ever. And earmuffs for the kids here. Uh, but I call this the Santa Claus uh, analogy that Sometimes in the training you're trying to get salespeople to do, it's really hard. Other times, it's like when you found out that Santa Claus wasn't real. You never had to be convinced again later that he wasn't, right? It was an instant switch. It was this light bulb moment that you go, oh, from now on, I'm doing life this way. I'm selling this way. And when you look for these really great nudges, these design solutions, that's what it is. It's instant results. It's instant behavioral change because it fits the way we should have been selling in the first place, the way we should have been teaching and educating in the first place. Yeah. And that's a, that's a huge point is that design thinking in terms of, you know, you always hear that don't judge a book by its cover, but people do. Um, uh, And there's a lot underneath it. So to your point, you could have the greatest content library in the world. If, if you're not able to access it um, or if it's not too far out of the flow of work, um, it can be really challenging to get people to, to take advantage for sure. Um, you know, our, our last training rule I want to talk about here is the one size fits all, um, because that's all I have budget for. This is a real world challenge that, you know, we've got to make it work in the budget we have. Um, and there's a single best way to, to deliver training and onboard information. Um, there are three things that Sandler, um, instills in our customers that we talk about all the time that don't require additional investment. So let's talk about what these underrated influences on success are. Role play and practice. This one's huge. Mike, you want to chime in on this one? Uh, I was getting excited. Sorry. No, you can go ahead and do yours. But um, these are the things that are free. So I I just wanted to highlight for everybody that a lot of times we're thinking it has to be expensive or difficult to make these changes. But when we go counterintuitive, when we do things that are free, we can actually extend the life of the learning, change the results and stuff that doesn't cost money, like role playing. And uh, we were talking about this this morning with our team, our enterprise sales team now said like having these scripts is not enough. What we need to do is get each of our reps to say these scripts out loud on a call 15 times over the next two weeks and they'll make it a habit. They'll have it down cold. But if they learn it once and they don't think about it again until 90 days later, that's not good enough. We have to role play and practice these in order to feel comfortable, you know, in those situations. Yeah, you think about all the rehearsals, going back to your your uh, theatrical uh, career, right? So the rehearsals, the performance, that is so important to have that role play. Um, and that's where that manager and leader involvement can come in and be absolutely just so valuable and holding the space for the, that role play, holding the space for that practice, modeling the behaviors that you want to see, the top tracks. A lot of organizations are going through transformational change right now. And I saw earlier in the comments that if you don't have the why behind it, it's hard to understand. You don't think it's permanent. It's not going to last. And so that manager or leader involvement to get, be there to give the why and to hold the space for the practice as people learn is so powerful. Um, and one of the great things about the way that we foster our training is there is so much role play um, in this <laughs> is that we, we introduce a technique or a concept 
and we get people using it right away so that they're thinking about what's my goal within one week to go out and give this a shot, either in front of a client, with a partner, um, and how we're going to actually make the change. The and in the new training, you wrote in manager involvement too, of yeah. saying like, okay, after the training, the manager needs to ask these questions in their next one-to-one -one with their sales team. And we need yeah. to, to discuss how it went, what they believed, you know, worked, didn't work, what went wrong so that they can continue to go through that process. And I think we find that, you know, out of all of the things that we do and that can influence the training, the manager and the leader involvement is the number one thing. Yeah. That if the manager goes, you know what, that's flavor of the week sales training. It doesn't work. I've always done it this way. And this is the way we've always done it. We're always going to do it. That's the way the salespeople will do it. They won't change. Yeah. If the manager says, this is, I believe in this, I've seen it work. This is the way we're going to do it and reinforces and role plays and holds people accountable for that. Then change happens and it moves. So it's one of those ironic processes of the world that the best way to get salespeople to sell more is to get a better manager is to have the manager exactly. make the change, not the salespeople themselves. And that was one of, you know, coming back to one of the rules we were going to break up at the top, it was like the best way to impact it is to get those frontline sellers trained. Actually, I would argue the opposite. If you've got a limited training budget, budget train the managers um, because they're actually going to make more of an impact than any high motivational training event you're going to see if it's not supported by them. Um, and then, you know, the, the last one, that I want to hit on here is making training actionable and accessible. Um, and so this has a lot to do with that design thinking um, that we were talking about. How are we designing the materials? What artifacts are we putting in front of learners? What's the progression they can go through to get to all of this content? Um, and so accessibility, you know, those types of things like, you know, the uh, subtitles and captioning and um, text to screen readers, that kind of stuff is great, but also making it accessible in the platforms and where they need it while they're doing the job. So that's the just in time uh, kind of content and training stuff. The actionable side of it, Mike, I'm glad you brought up those manager guides because that's actually making it easy. Not just tell the manager, hey, talk about this in your next meeting. Here are the four questions you're gonna ask people. Here's the assignment they were told to go do. This makes it really actionable. So you're scaffolding that learning and that performance in that continuous learning model. So the manager becomes a big part of that instead of having that all on the enablement or training arm uh, that, that's responsible for it. I wanted to highlight that one there too, because um, that's what we see in that inspirational one that we talked, right? Is that uh, it's a great idea, but it's sometimes it's really hard to put into action. So I probably shouldn't name names, but let's say you want to be vulnerable or courageous, or a challenger, or one of those other words that it's it's very conceptual. And you go, okay, well, if I want to go be curious on my calls or something, uh, that's great. But if we don't give them actionable ways of four things you can do to be more curious, or, you know, at Sandler, we have a, a great white paper of 101 questions you can ask on a sales call. You can download it at sandler.com. There you can go, okay, now I understand how to be more curious. I should be asking about these 12 different areas and these 100 different questions. Now I can actionably and accessibly take uh, progress, make progress on this insight we were trying to give. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's talk about the new rules for sales training, right? So this is going to map back um, to, to what we were talking about, is that personalized training and onboarding process can maximize your ROI. So this goes to that continuous learning model, meeting learners where they are um, and making sure that they're getting the information, how they need it, when they need it, right? The best way to improve sales performance is by developing that sales manager, not that frontline set seller. Um, the, the only path to sales success is by addressing behaviors, attitudes, and techniques together. If you're only focused on one side of the triangle, it's not going to come together into success. Um, the biggest impact uh, from that continuous learning, uh, the biggest impact comes from a continuous learning model, not uh, an SKO. SKOs are great. We have a lot of fun with them. Um, and they can be highly motivational for the year to set that vision, that why. Um, that's really important. But the bigger impact comes from hitting that again and again and again and modeling that behavior in the way that um, sales leaders lead. And the best way to deliver information over time 
is in multiple mode uh, is uh, sorry is over time and with multiple modalities. So if we think back to that continuous learning uh, chart, there were social learning podcasts, team leading uh, team team meetings, role plays. You're not going to just hit this stuff in one way. If you only role play, and you only ever role play, that can be effective. But sending new thought pieces, articles, videos to watch, um, that multiple modalities and ways of en engaging with new concepts and new ways of working, I think is really powerful. Um, and then finally, thinking about technology as a teammate and developing your learning agility. I think that's really a big key for salespeople. Um, we don't always know what's coming next. These disruptions come, uh, come from all places. But just getting ready um, to handle it and know with confidence that you can learn something, you can adapt. Um, I think that that's really, really powerful. Yeah. So this is the slide you can take a picture of. This is the to do's now. And I love what Elizabeth said here on strategizing uh, collaborations are better than role play sometimes because role play can get weird. Sometimes even if you use the word role play, it makes people yeah. tense up and and feel gross about it. But you can say simulations or you can say practice or you can do, like you said, group role plays. Or I think it's really about how you set it up yeah. in a lot of these things too, is that we're going to be in a continuous learning model. We expect you to not be good at this. We want you to be bad in the classroom or in the, the manager coaching meeting or the sales meeting so that you are not bad on the call. Yes. So we want to hear the worst 30 second commercial right now because we want to hear a good one when you call that big client that you need to close next week. Yeah. Now I want to ask everybody else to chime in on the chat here too. Now's your time to pop those into the comments. Uh, we have more stuff. We're going to give you a, a few more ways that Sandler has the, the secret sauce for actually moving the dial with salespeople. But before we do that, I want to hear what some of your best tips are. If you were going to make up a new rule for sales training, what would it be? What would be your rule for sales training? So Lisa, I'm sure there's a whole bunch we didn't put on here and oh, yeah. uh, I will give them some time to chat, but love this one already from Cliff. Uh, Sandler is a gym, not a hospital. You don't just do training when you have a need and somebody messes it up. Mm -hmm. You should be keep going. you got to get results over time. You don't just go to the gym once and, and expect to be fixed, or you don't go to the hospital and say, oh, we have a bad salesperson, fix them. You go, no, our best salespeople are training all of the time. Does yeah. anything else come to mind for you? Um, I think one of the other uh, kind of uh, new rules is to to really think about um, how to, how to learn from failure, right? That's a, that's another big one. You know, we don't want to fail in front of the customer, but mm -hmm. inevitably it happens. You lose that big deal that you thought was going to come in. Um, and that loss, that loss review, the, the, the humility that you have to bring to that conversation to be able to, you know, going back to my, my Adam Grant thing is think again, how do you separate your identity and your role to be able to take that feedback and really think about growth? I think that's a that's a big one for for sales training, especially when stakes can be high, especially with quotas and everything. Dana had a great one. Have a plan for those hostages in your training, yeah. people that won't or, or don't engage. It's natural, right? We when we've seen these adoption curves and and other things that some people love to try new things. They'll they'll take any advantage they can to get a, a slight edge on the competition. Other people are like, mm, let me let the rest of the sales team try out this new tactic, see how it goes, and I'll, I'll come along later. Or they think they've been doing it a long time. They know uh, no better. I think those are uh, natural things that we do have to plan for. And so that inspirational thing, and we're going to talk about this here in a second, but it's not just about being inspiring. Or if you don't inspire people, sometimes they don't do that actionable part. So we can't just say, here's the script, go do it, and expect them to, to do that either. We got a bunch of good rules coming in. Yeah. I really like, this is a long game. Go ahead. Yeah. I really like Jason's. Um, you want to highlight that the hold them accountable and they get uh, to hold you accountable as well. I love that style of leadership where managers invite their teams to hold them accountable as well. Um, that can Great be really tip for role play is the manager goes first. That's yeah. how you get over that role play hesitation is you got to be willing to do what you ask your salespeople to, to do and you go first. Yep. Um, good rule from Tony in our Sandler office in Green Bay. Iron sharpens iron. Um, work to increase the salesperson's confidence. John, yep. you stole this one out of my mind. This is one of, one of my words of the year for 2024 is I think 
in the pandemic and disruption and all of this change, I think a lot of people lost confidence. And I found that salespeople sell more when they feel good about themselves, what they're selling and the possibility in the marketplace. Uh, suspicious potato uh, has actually been surprisingly positive and optimistic. Yes, uh, actually, yeah. yes. But never leave a sale without asking for a follow-up meeting. I think asking what they want to do next. Yeah, or if you even should, don't be afraid to go for the the no there, but always have a next step, a next move in the process. And I think you could say never leave a sales training without knowing what your next reinforcement or, or yeah. follow-up is. Love that. Um, I, they're all, they're all, they're all, ooh, all right. This, this, it piques my interest, Daniel. I'm very curious. Um, one of the things that uh, going back to that emotional state, the skill that they, that um, the ability for a salesperson to influence that emotional purchase to buy it. Right. Um, that's like uh, that's active listening. That's the, the really the core of human to human communication. Um, and so it's really interesting to see how neuroscience is starting to come in and, and impact that as well. Um, just one other thing, Mike, that came to mind in terms of new rules for me, uh, in terms of sales training is going back to that hostage situation, sales training, especially in-person training used to be this hostage scenario with the way that we've shifted a lot more to virtual work, remote work, it can actually be more of a, an enticement, a privilege to be able to get nominated and, reward, to, and a reward. Um, for development. So really thinking about framing training as a reward, we are investing in you because we see potential. Um, that can really also help shift that paradigm for sure. Uh, Dan is uh, two slides ahead. Uh, yeah. Well, I think we have a lot of Sandler people on here. Too much behavior, too much just make the calls, make more uh, dials, make more outreach, do more emails, You know, get a chat GPT bot to automate more emails and spam more people and they'll buy from you doesn't work anymore. We we need to do it with the right attitude and the right technique. And we got to make the right dials, the, the right behaviors, the ones that, that lead to success. All right. Tell us a little bit about how we built these new rules into our new sales uh, development series that we kicked off uh, this year. It's happening. Yeah. It's right happening. The Sandler sales development series is out. It starts with the Sandler essentials, um, which for those of you who are familiar, it's the foundations program. It's how we onboard uh, to the really powerful Sandler selling system. Um, once we get into that, we have more content now um, than ever to develop that over time. So we think about what makes communication great, verbal, face-to-face, -face, and now we've expanded that to thinking about how do we captivate attention with email and text? Because that is a primary way that people are communicating. So this is just an example of one of the new modules we brought in. We have a framework for how to do this how to write your subject lines, how to make sure people are paying attention. What do we know about what grabs someone's attention when you're reading through an email or, cha um, or a chat message? So we've incorporated that into our content as well as making sure that we're incorporating technology, right? So we this one of the new guides you see in those mobile device frames is an AI powered business acumen guide of how you can use these generative AI partners. Now, don't use the free chat GPT for this one because it's locked to the internet 2022 and before. So think about which one you're using, um, but how it can be a thinking partner to help you get smarter about your market, your customer's market, your customer's customer, um, so that you can show up really prepared um, to dive deep into discovery with your clients and really help solution for them. So those are some of the ways that we've really started to incorporate that. We already talked about the manager tools, our within one week commitments. Um, we are just about to release a bunch more um, online modalities to help with that continuous learning journey. Um, but we really tried to focus on how do we nudge people into thinking about that behavior change incrementally and over time? Because we know that training, you, you can't learn how to ride a bike at a seminar. Um, after all, <laughs> that's kind of a big one. Um, so, uh, so Mike, with that, I'd love for you to get, get into some of the Sandler cl classics here of why this is so powerful. Yeah, I'm assuming most of the people on the, the call have heard some of these, but the other way we're breaking the rules, and we, we've shown it a couple of times and talked about it already, is the Sandler success triangles. And so we use this psychology-backed method of transforming behavior. So we don't just have the system for selling, which we're going to get to here in a, a second, but we have a system to develop people to actually execute the system correctly. And these are our new success triangles. I love it. 
Uh, it's called the impossible triangle or the infinity triangle because they're all tied together. You can't train attitude without the behavior or technique. You can't train behavior and just tell people what to do without telling them why they're doing it and how to, to do it, right? We can't just train technique and get really good at it, but don't worry about how many calls our salespeople make or whether they're doing it with the right tonality. We need to teach our, our sellers specifically how to do it, why to do it, what to do, make sure we're doing the right thing at the right time for the right reasons and to get the best results possible. So we have a ton on this. I've been doing a podcast for eight years now, over 650 episodes on just those three questions. What can we do in any specific situation to make sure we have the right attitude, the right behavior, and the right technique? And if you look at this with your buyers, with your salespeople, with your leaders and your organization, if you're not growing fast enough, it's the problem is in one of these three buckets. So, so give yourself a self-evaluation there. Absolutely, Mike. I think that's really powerful. Now, we talked about focusing on the sellers and the training. The core of our methodology of what we train comes from this too that this system is not about getting your people to do scripts. It's about creating road, road uh, curbs on the roadway so that you can be focused, laser focused on the customer at the middle. So in the middle of this circle, and I can make it bigger here, is the buyer's journey. They're going to engage with a the provider. They're going to consider, they're going to make a decision. And if they like it, they'll become advocates. And we want to build on top of this. So for me, what I think is interesting about what we want them to want sellers to do, and we can talk about each one of these buckets if we have time, or you can shout out in the chat which one you think is most important here, but it's all focused on the customer. How does the customer want to be communicated with? Or you can even think about your salespeople in the training. How are we going to communicate this training? What are the upfront contracts? What are the agreements of how we're going to go through this process so that nobody has any fears and worries and uh, uncertainty coming up that might derail and distract from the messages that we're trying to, to send. When we talk to our customers, we talk about what their reasons for change are. That's a really great question to ask your salespeople. Are they hitting quota? Are they loving life? Are they taking vacations and playing golf on Friday or, or traveling with the being home as much as they want for the kids? Or do they have a reason to change in the training that you're trying to, to build for them. Investment is their time, money, and resources from the customer, right? We want to change that script in our training as well. The investment is not just money. Sure, you can buy some content from Sandler, but what we're really looking for is a transformation of results, which means we got to get the salespeople's time committed to this. We need the leader's time to reinforce and role play. We need... Um, technology investments and systems. And maybe we need to tweak some stuff in the CRM for one of those design solutions or technology nudges. Mm -hmm. The decision-making process for the, the buyer is how, when, where, why they're going to make a decision. And is that going to be in our favor? I think we need to think about um, our sales training that way too, right? When are we going to have it? Who's going to be involved? How are we going to deliver it? What are we going to um, decide so that we can get to these right results. And then when we deliver the training or present our solution, we're delivering a customized solution to our salespeople's pain within our investment budget, within all of the criteria we need to make it a success and decide what the outcomes of the training are going to be, and we can nail it. And so present solution for salespeople is, we're not just presenting the same thing over and over again, we're presenting exactly what our buyers need to hear in order to make the best decision possible for them. And then post-sale in the sales world is sticking around, making sure they don't get buyer's remorse, handing them off to the delivery team or setting up referrals and future business and ongoing uh, contract renewals or things like that and quarterly value reviews. But think about that as it relates to sales training then. What happens post-training that reinforces and confirms the messages and the decisions and the changes they just said they would would make. And yeah. so uh, I'll let you answer Don's question here and, and share any thoughts you have on the methodology. But we did, this is the same model as the Sandler submarine. We just got rid of the metaphor here 
because we changed some key things about this. Do you want to share those? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the big things um, that, you know, the Sandler submarine is well loved. It's still out there. We still have it in uh, some of our, uh, our historical library. Uh, but we've moved on. We've evolved the model because we really wanted to think about the way that this focuses on the buyer journey, which is why it's on the, that inner ring um, and how the seller system relates to what the buyer is going through. Um, because if we go back to that spaghetti bowl model of buyer dysfunction, buyers, yeah, we have these nice four clear stages on a graphic here, but we know it's not that simple. Buyers go back and forth. They move around the circle. They, they hop around um, as they're going through their decision-making process. And what we really wanted to focus on was the fact that the sellers can be agile too. So we can work with them. We can follow them anywhere that they're going to go when you're trained in a system like this. It's not um, as simple as sealing a compartment before you move to the next anymore because buyer dysfunction has gotten uh, a bit bigger. Now, we still think we want to be airtight. We want to lock down. That's how you prevent loss of sale later, right? Is you do these behaviors up front. You talk about that pain. You uncover all of that information. You qualify really well. Um, and that protects you as a salesperson from that buyer dysfunction. That's still really critical. Uh, but we have we have evolved the model here to think about the modern way that people buy and sell. Yeah, yeah I'll add a, a few quick quick thoughts and you can go to the to the next slide, Lisa. But um, one, the the war metaphor is not great, especially when we do international training around the world, Don. So sometimes people don't like the idea of a World War II submarine. Two, it, we don't want to encourage a combative relationship or a war metaphor with our buyers. And I think number three, uh, it was a really great metaphor for a really long time. But if you think about it, we were kind of sealing the doors and filling the sub. If you fill a sub up, it sinks. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't exactly work in all situations. And, and we think we've made some improvements to that. Yeah. Um, and how we got here in these continuous improvements is a perfect transition slide for us. So I'll let you talk about this one, Lisa, and how this is never done for us. Right. Even after 57 years, we haven't finished sales training. We didn't win sales training, even though we happen to be the largest, we're still continuing this improvement and finding new ways to, to win a new rule. Absolutely. And this keeps my team very busy, which is exciting. <laughs> um, and so one of the things, you know, Mike talked about how big we are um, at, up at the top with our, you know, 100, 400 uh, or so sales trainers worldwide. Um, and they are helping us innovate, which is great because they're on the front lines. They're interacting with uh, real world challenges as they come up. And we are helping to kind of pull up that knowledge and then cascade it back out. So some of our more recent content additions that we've added um, just in the past quarter have been uh, the chat GPT advantage, how to sell in the age of AI, aligning sales and marketing for CRM success. So again, th that's combining team selling technology to uh, technology as a teammate as well, which we talked about earlier, you know, it, the lone wolf salesperson, that high performer, that old paradigm is moving on and our content is moving on with it. Um, and so we talk about the, the three critical questions about AI for sales leaders. Um, and so we're, we're grappling with a lot of this change as you all, all are, and we're hoping to provide some really powerful thought leadership and continuous learning uh, to, to move ourselves forward and continue to be valuable. We can show the results slide a little bit here. This is a, a celebration for Lisa's team and all of our, our trainers around the world. Uh, I'm assuming you probably, you know, we wouldn't show the stats that showed uh, Sandler wasn't improving results. Uh, but this is independent data from Columbia University uh, on a capstone workshop project that they did for us, showing that all of these do help you sell more. It was the title of this webinar is Break the Rules and Close More Sales. These aren't slight nudges. So the thing I want to highlight here, and then I want to invite you to our Sandler Summit, and we'll put the, the link up for that here too, is that you're seeing 60, 40, 32%. When we do the same thing a little bit more, when we just go for behavior and say, make more calls, say this more, you know, run the script, you might then grow five, 10%, but you don't get this 32 to 66% improvement rates that, that we have up there. So if any of this was interesting for you, you can always reach out to a local Sandler trainer. But if you go right now to sandler.com slash summit, we are in the sweet spot. We are weeks away from our world's largest uh, sales uh, leadership conference. For Sandler, we bring together all of our trainers from around the world. Uh, we invite all of our 50,000 clients to show up in Orlando, Florida. Uh, there'll be over 1,000 top performers there March 19th and 20th. 
And we have some amazing outside speakers too. So part of our continuous improvement process is not just Sandler speakers, but bringing in like Michelle Rigby Assad, a former CIA undercover intelligence officer that worked in the Middle East to talk about uh, women and negotiations and communication skills, especially in hostage negotiations and other high profile negotiations. Dr. Eli Jones talking about AI and the state of sales and marketing from Texas A&M University, Jay Schwendelson, subject line guru from uh, around like just internationally well-known for email subject lines. And then Louis, my man, uh, Louis Gravance from Walt Disney Company. He was their customer service trainer, closing it out in Orlando for us. And then I'll close it out for us here today. We would love to see you there. Tickets are on sale. Virtual tickets, only 250 bucks. But if you can come see us in Orlando, I highly recommend it. And until next time, um, whatever you are, uh, be a good one. I, I think that's a great thing to land on. Hopefully go sell more, go get it done. And uh, don't forget that this is a continuous improvement process for you. So keep going and we'll see you next time, everybody. Good luck.